Well, I can say that it is a great pleasure to be back here uh, in Helsinki. We've had a wonderful time, and uh, it has been incredible to return and see people from the laboratory uh, where I spent five years working on how the turtle gets its shell, which is something I won't be talking about today. Talked about that earlier this week and had a very good time. Uh, but I will be talking about an area of biology which is relatively new, and I'm really glad to be involved in this first session with two other people who I think uh, will form uh, a unit where the parts will be less than the whole. I think the whole will be much greater than each of the parts. They'll, all of these separate talks should integrate together into a very interesting <coughs> unit. And I think also that the metaphors that will be coming out, since you mentioned this notion of uh, how the biological and the social get integrated together, I think that we're going to find some fascinating new metaphors. I can speak for myself by saying I have no monopoly on the knowledge of this area. And there might be several people in the audience who have been thinking about what our new knowledge of biology actually means in a social context. So please, during the question and answers, bring in your comments. This is uh, why we're here talking at meetings, is actually not only to present information, but to get information, not only from our uh, other speakers, but from the audience. Uh, we're still very much in the process of learning. So should I begin? It's OK. Yes. It's OK. I, good. I'll be talking about a new way of looking at medicine, because it's a new way of looking at biology, and indeed, a new way of approaching nature. I'll be talking about the biology of the 21st century. And I'll make the claim, arguable, that the biology of the 20th century, the one that I learned, and the biology of the 21st century are radically different biologies. The biology of the 20th century was a biology of being and a biology of things. The biology of the 21st century is a biology of becoming and a biology of relations. And I think that we're entering into a new way of looking at nature and a new way of looking at medicine. Usually, when we talk about medicine, we're talking about medicine for individuals, that it's the individual who is the target of a medicine, whereas public health is for communities. So I want to ask, what is the individual animal? What is this individual we're talking about? And usually, in biology, we have six to seven ways of defining an individual. There's anatomical individuality. That's if you wanted to count the number of people in this room, you'd count the number of individuals. It's kind of the visual one, one body. Physiological individuality, integrated organ systems towards a common end that the circulatory system, the respiratory system, the uh, reproductive system, they're all working in harmony together. Developmental individuality. This was the individuality proposed by Thomas Huxley, that we are all coming from the zygote, that our body is basically a pure body racially. It is the same genotype. The body comes from one cell. Then there is immune individuality. If I were to take my skin and put it onto you, you would reject it. We have an immune system which defends us, which determines what is self and what is not self, and that is on the basis of our skin. Genetic individuality, again, going back to development. The genome of all our cells is the same, and we are identicals to the point of view biologically that we have the same genome. And then there's individuality of evolution. Individuals, whether organisms or genes, are those things which get selected. And I want to contend that all of these may be fundamentally wrong, and that we don't have individuality on any of these levels. 
In fact, we are what are called holobionts. And a holobiont is a community. Matter of fact, it's an integrated set of communities. It's the animal or plant plus its persistent microbial symbionts. So when we think of a cow, we usually think of that female bovine mammal eating grass. But cattle can't eat grass. They can't digest cellulose. They have no enzymes to, to digest cellulose. Their genome doesn't make them. Rather, it's the symbionts' genomes. They have genes that make enzymes that can digest cellulose. The termite, this is Master Termes darwinensis, a tropical pest. It eats wood, it eats houses, only it can't. The termite itself has no enzymes which will digest cellulose or lignin, the major compound of wood. It can't eat wood. Instead, it has a protist that digests wood, Mixotricha paradoxica, which lives in its gut. Only Mixotricha isn't an organism either. It's a composite of five organisms. What look like uh, cilia here are actually spirochete bacteria. Four bacteria, one protist. So we seem to be communities. The coral over here, what we call coral, is a holobiont. It's not only the cnidarian, the polyp, it also is the algae, the zooxanthellae that live within the cells. The zooxanthellae are needed by the cnidarian, they're needed by the coral, because they produce not only oxygen, but the carbohydrate nutrients that are used by the coral. When the symbionts leave, as in global thermal warming, global uh, warming, when the symbionts leave, the coral dies. It's called bleached coral. So I want to go over some of these areas of individuality. Uh, this is a cross-section of the hive that I grew up in in New York City. And if we take one of those individuals, we find that this individual is a collection of ecosystems. And these are only a few of them because the skin has several ecosystems. The skin on your right hand is different than the skin on your left hand. Uh, about 50% of the cells in our body are prokaryotic. The human species has about 1,100 major bacterial species that are part and parcel of being human, sometimes called the 11th organ system. I don't like that metaphor. It's really several ecosystems. We are an island with many ecosystems on it and we interact with other islands and other ecosystems. So we're not individuals anatomically. 50% of our cells, at least, are microbes. Now, what about genetically? This is a big one in the United States, the notion of genetic individuality. Uh, Life magazine, that wonderful Let Nielsen with the first days of creation, the result of fertilization is a single nucleus that contains an entire biological blueprint for a new in individual, genetic information governing everything from the length of the nose to diseases that it will inherit. A lot of anti-abortion websites use this notion. You are who you are at fertilization because that's when you get your genome. That's when you become an individual. And even more amazingly, intelligence and personality, the way you look and feel, were already in place in your genetic code. At the moment of conception, you were essentially and uniquely you. This is on many anti-abortion websites. What Dorothy Nelkin and Susan Lindy have shown in a book, The DNA Mystique, where they looked at how DNA is represented in popular literature, they came up with a frightening conclusion. They said DNA has become the secular analog of soul, that which is our essence that which determines our behavior, that even from which you could be resurrected after death, a la Jurassic Park, okay? My wife is from Olu. Her background is Olu Linen. And she gets the Finnish American newsletter. And in that newsletter, it said, and I'm quoting, the sauna is in the, day, the, sauna is in the DNA of every Finn. <laughs> 
Rosfanti Pabo has looked at a lot of Finnish DNA. The sauna is not there. The sauna is in the soul of every Finn. And this notion that DNA is becoming synonymous with soul is really something to watch for, to look for, because it's a very pernicious thing in the contemporary uh, literature. Okay. Well, I want to say that genetically, we are not merely the representatives of the DNA in our fertilized eggs. And I want to go first to insects. This is shown beautifully, for instance, in the pea aphid. This is an insect which is solely female. It regulates meiosis so that it, the polar body comes back, fertilizes the egg, only females. And so it actually delivers offspring daily, about five or six per day. And as you see here, this is temperature. And this is how many offspring it has per day. And there are two groups here. One has a symbiont called Bucknera, and the Bucknera has an allele which gives a chaperonin protein. That's the wild type, the dark pink here. There are also Bucknera that have a mutant, a stop codon, which gives a short form of the uh, chaperonin protein, the heat shock protein, which doesn't work. So when you expose the P aphid to heat, what happens is, under most temperatures, the fecundity is a bit higher in those without the heat shock protein. But at high temperatures, which are well within the range of this species of P aphids, when you have high temperatures, you need the thermotolerance protein there. You need the chaperonin protein in order to continue having offspring. Without the chaperonin protein, you are relatively infertile. So here we have a notion of thermotolerance. And that thermotolerance is not given by an allele of the P aphid genome. It's given by an allele of the P aphid's symbionts genome. Continuing with the P aphid, the P aphid also has some individuals which seem to be resistant to parasitoid wasp infection. Here's a wasp laying its egg in a juvenile P. aphid. And that egg will become a larva and will eat the P. aphid from within. And the P. aphid has developed a way of becoming immune to the parasitoid wasp. So here is percent parasitized up here. And here is the P. aphid without a symbiont. This P. This is your normal P. aphid, but without a symbiont called Hamiltonella. With Hamiltonella, the parasitism goes way down. In other words, this bacteria, Hamiltonella, is preventing the parasitoid wasp from infecting the whole organism, the P. aphid. But it turns out that there's a particular allele that's necessary in the bacteria. This allele is critical, and if you get rid of this allele, you go back to the normal levels of parasitism. Well, it turns out this isn't an allele. This is a bacteriophage of the bacteria. In other words, this is a symbiont of the symbiont that's giving the immunity. So it's all these together. It's the P. aphid, it's Bucknera, I'm sorry, it's the P. aphid, it's Hamiltonella, and the symbiont of Hamiltonella, this 5A uh, parasitoid, uh, uh, lysogenic phage. Okay, well, we have in the human population a situation where different bacteria have given us different abilities. I don't know if they're selected or not, but Japanese populations have different varieties of Bacteroides plebeus than American populations. The Bacteroides plebeus in Japan differs from the Bacteroides plebeus in America by two genes. And these two genes are genes that have got by lateral uh, uh, colonization of the genome, horizontal gene transfer, from 
similar species that grow on fucus, that grow on red algae, the kind of algae you find in sushi. These genes are involved in complex carbohydrate metabolism. These genes make proteins that allow the people to digest the carbohydrates found in seaweed. So the Japanese populations get more, more calories from the seaweed than the American populations. Probably not selective, but we now know that there is genetic variation between the symbionts of humans. If I were to ask someone from my developmental biology class, what is this? I would hope that they would say, oh, this is from an ovarium of an insect and you have 16 nurse cells and these nurse cells are feeding the future oocyte and they're giving something red, whether it be bicoid mRNA, nanos mRNA, ribosomes, they're giving something, they're feeding something to the future oocyte and they'd be absolutely correct. In this case, what's being stained red here is Wolbachia bacteria. Wolbachia is being concentrated in the oocyte and that's how it spread from one generation to another through the female germline, just like mitochondria. In humans, we get our bacteria primarily from the mother, but not by germline transmission, but by proximate infection. As soon as the amnion breaks, we become colonized by bacteria. As we pass through the birth canal, we get colonized by bacteria that are in the birth canal and adjacent to the birth canal. And so we get our mother's bacteria directly as we are being born. So there are mechanisms of genetic transmission of bacteria, of the symbionts. So we're not anatomically individuals, we're not genetically individuals. What about developmental? This notion that the individual is the organism from ovum to ovum, the progeny of the zygote. Well, developmentally, we need others. This is totally different than the biology I learned. 1996, Lewis Wolpert, one of the greatest biologists of the late 20th century, asked the question, he asked, will, will, we, will we be able to compute the adult phenotype if we know every molecule and the place of every molecule in the fertilized egg? And we now know the answer. The answer is no, we wouldn't. And that's because symbionts are critical in giving us some of our phenotypes. So here, this is uh, one of those horrible parasitoid wasps, and uh, this is its ovary, and in the ovary are these eggs, and you can see in the eggs here, here's the nucleus, and it's stained with propidium iodide, which stains nucleic acid, stains DNA. What you see over here, all these DNAs, what are they? They are Wolbachia bacteria. And you can get rid of the Wolbachia bacteria by just growing these Egg, growing the larva in rifampicin, growing it in some antibiotic that gets rid of bacteria. And what happens is, in females, is you get rid of the ovary. The bacteria are necessary for the continuation of the ovary. The ovary undergoes apoptosis, 35% of the cells or so, undergo apoptosis if there are no symbionts. Put in the symbionts hardly any uh, apoptosis, cell no cell death. Without the symbionts, cell death goes up to about one-third of all the cells. In mammals, mammals need symbionts for the production of the gut-associated capillaries and the gut-associated lymphoid tissue. Here we have germ-free mice uh, intestinal intestines, and these are the villi of the small intestine of a germ-free mouse, a mouse that's never seen bacteria. And the capillaries shown in green are very rudimentary. 
if you add back bacteria, especially bacteroides, you get back the capillary system. This is the capillary system that brings food to the body. Similarly, the gut-associated lymphoid tissue, the dome and the follicle of the gut-associated lymphoid tissue, the activated B cells and T cells, you need different bacteria in order to get them. Without the bacteria, you do not get the gut-associated lymphoid tissue. How does this happen? What are the bacteria doing? It turns out, and this is the paper that drew me into the field, 2001. This is the paper that I looked at it and had a moment of, well, oh shit. Uh, I've been writing a textbook on developmental biology and I have not included this material. This is paradigm shifting material. Basically, what it says is that the bacteria induce normal gene expression in our gut cells. That the gut expects bacteria to have normal gene expression. So here we have three proteins, colipase, which is involved in lipid transport, angiogenin, this should be angiogenin 4. This is involved in capillary formation, angiogenin, capillary former. And SPRR2A, which is a matrix protein that separates bacteria from the gut. This over here is relative RNA, mRNA abundance for these three proteins. Germ-free mice over here, normalized to 1.0. So that's what you get in a germ-free mouse. But that's not what you get in a conventionally raised mice. If you have a mouse with normal bacteria, or if you have a germ-free mouse and you add back gut bacteria, you have about five to six times more mRNA for colipase. For angiogenin, you have about eight times more mRNA. And for SPRR2A, you have 50-fold. So not having bacteria is like having a mutant in the mouse, which only makes 2% of the mRNA or 10% of the mRNA for these proteins. The normal mouse, the mouse that you normally see in the lab anyway, conventionally raised, has many, has much more gene expression for these genes than a germ-free mouse. What are these activated genes doing? Well, they're inducing the expression of the gut-associated lymphoid tissue, the gut-associated capillaries. In zebrafish, they're inducing stem cell proliferation. The stem cell of the intestine does not divide unless it gets signals. And these signals are coming predominantly from the bacteria. The magenta cells here are dividing cells. They're S phase cells. The other cells are not dividing. These are the cells that are going to become the epithelium of the, of the gut. It actually is, uh, they're making, they're putting beta catenin in, in the nucleus. It's, they're essentially mimicking the Wnt pathway. Even after birth, we get the, or in adults, the symbionts may be important for development. This over here, this is ovariectomized mice. It's the mouse model of human menopause, where this is a control mouse, and this is the bones of the femur and the vertebra. And you can see that they're relatively thick. If you take away the estrogen, if you ovariectomize the mouse, they become much thinner. And that's because over, uh, estrogen is responsible for suppressing osteoclasts. Osteoclasts will take away, they'll remove bone. And when you get rid of uh, estrogen, the osteoclasts increase and bone density is lost. A certain strain of lactobacillus, lactobacillus ruteri, can actually act as an estrogen and replace the missing uh, bone mass by suppressing osteoclast development. It can also happen early in development. This, the second division, the polarity of the second division of the nematode brugia is dependent on symbionts. Without its Wolbachia symbi uh, symbionts, its 
polar division, which is supposed to be in a particular direction, is randomized. Back to zebrafish. This is a paper that came out this December. I think it can be very important. Basically, it says that germ-free zebrafish have less beta pancreatic cells than zebrafish with the bacteria. And this is reflected in the amounts of insulin produced and in the amounts of glucose being metabolized. So here we have germ-free zebrafish. Here we have conventionally raised zebrafish, and the green here are the pancreatic beta cells, the insulin-making cells. And it turns out that this expansion, this postnatal expansion, about day four to six in zebrafish, is due to one type of bacteria, Aromonas bacteria. Not only that, it's due to one gene in the Aromonas bacteria, a gene that makes a protein which has been called 10165, sometimes called the Beth-A protein. Uh, this protein is sufficient when given to the zebrafish to restore, to germ-free zebrafish, to restore the mass of beta pancreatic cells. Now, what's really interesting is what this might mean for humans, because humans also have an expansion of pancreatic beta cells that goes on for about two years. Diabetes type 1 is 50% discordant in identical twins. In other words, there's an environmental component. Differences in this postnatal expansion is thought to generate the large variation in adult cell populations, and differences in beta cell numbers have been seen as a predisposition to type 2, adult onset diabetes. Moreover, the mouse genetic models, like the Nod model for diabetes, can be ameliorated by adding particular microbes to the body, and that there are microbes in the human gut that make that Beth-A protein. One of the interesting things is that Beth-A gene in zebrafish is not detected by metagenomic analysis. It is a rare gene. It is a gene that is present in very, very small amounts, amounts that are undetectable, probably less than 0.1% of the genes. So it's a dangerous situation. What we'll hear in the next talk, I believe, is about the hygiene hypothesis, where people are worried that we may, through urbanization, through ultra-cleanliness, be getting rid of bacteria that are critical for human health and even, I would say, human development. There are many important consequences that bacteria have in development. One is medically, we can actually get rid of worm diseases, helminth diseases such as Mancinella, filarial worm, by common antibiotics such as doxycycline. Mancinella has become immune to helminthides. It won't be killed by the normal worm-killing drugs, but it can kill, still be killed by antibiotics against bacteria because it needs, it needs bacteria to molt. Without molting, it dies. And so antibiotics can, still, can, still, can kill Mancinella. The spotted salamander in America is being killed off by herbicides. Now, herbicides should not kill off salamanders. Herbicides kill plants, not amphibians. But this particular amphibian, when it lays its eggs, the eggs are in this big mass, and the inner cells, anything that's not on the outside, is going to have a hard time getting oxygen. The female salamander not only lays the eggs, but she gives the eggs a particular algae. She has algae that's stored in a reproductive tract. It coats the eggs, and the algae make the oxygen, makes this whole environment hyper-oxygenic so that the eggs in the inner part of the egg mass can develop. Corals, the coral symbionts are critically important, as I mentioned earlier. They can be gotten rid of by heat or by sun, some sunscreens, and as a result, they, the apoptosis of the symbiont occurs or the leaving of the symbiont occurs, leaving the coral bleached, and as a result, the coral does not get carbon nutrients, and doesn't get oxygen. 
What I'm saying here is we actually develop with other species. We develop with the other. Our brain may develop with the other. And that's because about 30% of the metabolites in our blood come from bacteria or are induced by bacteria. Much of the material in our blood is made or induced by bacteria. So even the brain can be responsive to this. This is NGF1A, which is a transcription factor involved in neural plasticity. BDNF, a paracrine factor, similarly involved in neuroplasticity. Germ-free mice have very little of these, whereas mice with known bacteria, the basically reconstituting gut bacteria, have much larger amounts. During evolution, the colonization of gut microbiota has become integrated into the programming of brain development affecting motor control and anxiety-like behavior. This is really an interesting field, that bacteria may be involved in brain development and behaviors. Uh, this would have been science fiction 10 years ago. Uh, but germ-free mice have an autism-like sy symptoms, some of which can be cured by adding back normal gut microbes. Now, I'm not going to say that mouse autism models are the same as human autism models but they have similar characteristics, such as avoidance uh, of other mice, uh, in the case of the mice, avoidance of others, and uh, lack of uh, exploration and obsessive self-grooming. And if you look at time spent in the chamber with other mice, germ-free mice, much less time spent with other mice, but you can get this behavior back again, you get normal behavior back again, even more so, by adding bacteria to the germ-free mice. Self-grooming. Here's the germ-free. Self-grooms a lot. The control mice do not, and if you add bacteria back to the germ-free mice, you get it back to normal levels. Title, Micro microbiota is essential for social development in the mouse. Similarly, Shao et al. in uh, Sarkis Masmanian's lab have shown that Bacteroides fragilis is extremely important in uh, preventing a different mouse model of autism, and it seems to do so, it seems to help cure the effects of the mouse autism by making the epithelium less permeable to other bacterial products, such as uh, 4-EPS, which is an anxiety-causing uh, molecule, and it prevents the, the leakage so by actually making the epithelium of the gut stronger, it can do something to the brain and cognition. So, animals are symbiopoetic organisms. We don't develop autonomously from the fertilized egg. As Donna Haraway says, we become with the other. This is something which is, I think, a whole new area of developmental biology. So we're not developmental individuals. We're not anatomical individuals. We're not genetic individuals. We are not immune individuals either. And the immune system, when I taught it, I taught immune system in the 1980s during the AIDS epidemic. And we knew what the immune system was. The immune system protected us from a hostile outside world which was going to eat us if we did not have an immune system. And the immune system was thought of as our defensive weaponry against a hostile outside world. It determined what was self, what was non-self. Well, the new perspective, really, is that it's not our defensive weaponry. The immune system is like really nasty passport control agents or bouncers at a very exclusive nightclub. Uh, they know who to let in and who to keep out. They've learned by evolution that there are some microbes that you don't want to exclude from the body, you actually want them for the body. And so we learn here that these results underscore the adaptive immune system's critical role in establishing a sustainable host microbial relationship. That's what, not what the immune system I learned did. This may involve the creation of an optimal symbiotic environment on the interior of the pyre's patches. 
I mean, to me, I learned that pirate patches make SIGA, which destroyed bacteria. No, it's making an optimal symbiotic environment. Therefore, commensal bacteria exploit the toll-like receptor pathway to actively suppress immunity. I learned toll-like receptors were the core of innate immunity. We propose that the immune system can discriminate between pathogens and the microbiota through recognition of symbiotic bacterial molecules in a process that engenders commensal colonization, that the immune system is acting like a range manager or a park manager, physiological individuality. Okay. This is the notion that we are, that we have different living things in our body called cells, but these cells act together towards a common end. Well, so do the microbes. So we have here Planococcus, the mealy bug. It's an insect. It's a true bug. It has in its skin Tremblia, which is a bacterium. It's a symbiont of Planococcus. Tremblia has in its cytoplasm Marinella, which is a smaller bacterium. Nested dolls, kind of Russian dolls here. Insect, symbiont, symbiont, symbiont. And what you have here is the pathway for phenylalanine. It starts in the symbiont, and then it goes to the symbiont, symbiont, back to the symbiont. The final step is done by an enzyme encoded by the genome of the insect. So a lot of this is done through the symbiosis between insect symbiont and symbiont symbionts, nested symbioses. And by the way, the genomes of these have changed because you don't need all these redundant genes. And so that they are pretty much set now. You can't get rid of this. They are integrated to a pathway. As I mentioned before, about one third of an animal's metabolome, the diversity of molecules carried in its blood, has a microbial origin. Thus, the circulatory system extends the chemical impact of that gut microbiota throughout the body. This notion of co-metabolism, that when we talk about physiology, we have to talk about the physiology of the holobiont, not just the, our genome, but all the thousands of insects, of, of bacterial genomes, was underscored by uh, a paper by Smith et al. in Jeffrey Gordon's lab. They went to Malawi to find identical twins who were discordant for quasiorcor, where one twin had quasiorcor, the other twin did not. Here we have a situation where they are twins. They have the same genome. They are in the same home. Why does one twin have this disease and the other doesn't? Again, when I was learning about quasiorcor, it was called a protein deficiency disease. And indeed, you need to get this disease you have to have protein deficient diets. But why does one person get it and his identical twin does not? And it turns out to be the bacteria. The bacteria of the twins can metabolize proteins in different ways. They can get different uh, amounts of energy from them. And what they found that when they injected, when they took, not injected, when they took germ-free mice and they got the gut microbes from the quasiorcor twin, and they put that in a germ-free mice, into germ-free mice, and then they gave the germ-free mice a protein-deficient diet. Those mice developed the syndromes of quasiorcor. When they took microbes from the gut of the twin that did not have quasiorcor, put that into the gut of a germ-free mouse, and fed those mice a protein-deficient diet, those mice did not get quasiorcor. It seemed that whether or not the mice or the people got quasiorcor depended on the gut microbes. And when they changed the gut microbes, which is very easy to do by diet, when you change the gut microbes, you actually changed the condition, the medical condition, and the twin with quasiorcor started behaving and eating normally. So the microbiota 
is involved in the circulatory system, digestive system, neuroendocrine system, bone system, the immune system. It's part of us. The microbes are part of us. Symbionts regulate responses to important drugs, digoxin, they're involved in tumor drugs, anti-cancer drugs are modulated by intestinal microbes. Uh, over here, cardiac drugs are digested differently by different microbes, antipsychotic drugs, diabetes medications. This is important because we've heard a lot of this notion of individualized medicine based on the human genome. And I'll contend that personalized medicine has to be aware not only of the human genome, but, of the, but also of the holo-genome, the genome of us, the human genome, plus our microbial genomes, and that changes every time you eat. That is a changing genome. That is a genome which has a core and a periphery, and the periphery is responsive to the environment. Again, talk about physiologically who we are. Pregnant women have different bacteria in their gut and reproductive tract at different stages of reproduction, different stages of pregnancy, such that third trimester women have microbes in their gut, which when given to germ-free mice will make them fatter and give them insulin desensitization, just as in the pregnant women. First trimester women have normal microbes in, the, in their gut. The composition of the microbes in the gut changes such that when the baby is born, when the fetus comes through the, digest, comes through the reproductive tract, it gets bacteria from the distal end of the digestive tract and it gets the bacteria that's in the reproductive tract and those are not the normal bacteria. That's bacteria that's been selected during the third trimester. And then what does the mother do? The mother gives the baby breast milk. Breast milk contains more bacteria. Breast milk also contains two sets of nutrients. One set of nutrients is for the newborn. That's you know, kind of obvious. You give the baby food to grow. The other set of nutrients are a specific set of oligosaccharides that no mammal can digest. They're not for the newborn. They're for bifidobacteria. Therefore, a set of bacteria that you want to be the first colonizers of the gut. You want bifidobacteria to multiply and to have a selective advantage and to be the first ones there because they'll make the conditions for bacteroides and the other bacteria that you want. Uh, you know, John Dunn said, no man is an island. And he was right sociologically, but he was wrong biologically. Biologically, we are an island and the rules of island colonization, biogeography, are really good. The first group of invaders, the first group of colonizers set the conditions for the next. And it's really important, certainly in macaque monkeys, where you could do the experiments, those which are reared on mother's milk have a totally different bacterial population than those that are reared on formula alone. Very different populations of bacteria. These bacteria are important because they give different populations of lymphocytes. More T helper 17 cells that are found in the breast-fed macaques than formula-fed. And Th17 cells are important because they produce interleukins against candida and salmonella, which are really important in terms of uh, pathogenesis. I want to end by briefly mentioning individuals in evolution. So we said that we're not individuals anatomically, we're not individuals genetically, we're not individuals immunologically, we're not individuals physiologically. Well, what does this mean for evolution? Because evolution often is about the selection of an individual. What does individual selection be like if there's no individual? So life, said Lynn Margulis, did not take over the globe by combat, but by networking. And we saw that there's genetic variation through symbionts. You know, the P. aphid story, for instance, 
There's also, and I won't mention it here, reproductive isolation through symbionts. Symbionts can give selective mating preferences. Symbionts also could produce cytoplasmic incompatibility where two populations, one having one symbiont, one having another symbiont, cannot reproduce together, which is kind of the, the you need reproductive isolation to get speciation. But I think one of the most interesting stories in evolution concerns the origin of multicellularity. I mean, we're getting really to the bottom here. You know, how do animals form? What is the origin of the animal? And the closest thing to an animal is coanoflagellates. That's the sister group to animals, coanoflagellates. And coanoflagellates, uh, such as this one over here, uh, S. rosetta, uh, they form more and more single-celled organisms, except when they don't. If they are cultured in algorophagous bacteria, which is a bacteroides-like bacteria, they divide to become multicellular organisms. They really divide to become an epithelia. This has an extracellular matrix, and they have cytoplasmic connections between the cells. This S. rosetta is found often with algorophagous bacteria found in marine environments, animal guts, soil. And so the origin of metazoans may be a symbiosis between bacteria and coanoflagellates. So there's really no traditional individuality. In addition to this notion evolutionarily, of the battle of each against all, we also have to deal with becoming with the other. Most of our cells, at least 50%, are microbial. The microbes and our cells from our zygote are joined into metabolic pathways. The gut microbes help build our organ systems. They're part of our development. The microbes help build our immune system, the gut-associated lymphoid tissue the T helper cells, they expand the, the lymphocyte repertoire. The microbes actually become self. There's a lot of interesting stuff going on, a lot of new papers on how the microbes are recognized as self. Genetic individuality, the genome actually evolved with those of the symbionts. We have over 100 different genomes in our body and many probably with phenotypic outcomes, especially if you look at digestions of medicines and drugs. And symbionts can provide selectable variation and genetic isolation. So maybe we should think of ourselves as teams. And if you've tried to be on an athletic team or tried to be in an orchestra, you know that making the team is a very charged metaphor. Yes, making the team means constructing the team, but there's competition to be on the team. I'm not saying there's no competition here, no. There's a merger of competition and cooperation in a way that I'm trying to find. I'm trying to find out what the best metaphor is. Right now, I think a team is a very good metaphor. Making the team is a competitive operation. And then you make a cooperative entity that can compete with other cooperative entities in a larger cooperative entity called the league, which can compete with other leagues and so forth. So symbiosis is the evolutionary strategy that supports life on Earth. Whether it's the rhizobacteria legumes for nitrogen fixation in the atmosphere, the mycorrhizal interactions with plant roots and seeds, the endophytic fungal protection that protects plants against desiccation and other pathogens, the coral reef and tidal grass ecosystems that sustain oceanic biodiversity. These are the grand symbioses. And within those symbioses, are the smaller symbiotic webs that we call organisms and the product of more ancient symbioses that we call cells, the endosymbiont theory, and even the products of more ancient symbioses that we call genomes. Much of the mammalian genome, some very important parts of the mammalian genome, comes from other sources. So it's really, this is being presented by Team Scott Gilbert. Wish I had a rally jacket, you know, it's all, you know, bacteroides, bacillus, all these things which are helping me go. And I was very glad to see that in a time where 
Finland is celebrating its independence, it's also celebrating its interdependence. And that the whole idea of together has been the theme of the centennial of independence. I just think that's a wonderful you know, uh, merger of cooperation, competition, interdependence, dependence, independence. Thank you very much. Uh, again, going back to some of the work of, of philosopher Donna Haraway, uh, she said that uh, the relation is the smallest, well, she first said the smallest unit of, of characterization. And then she said the relation is the smallest process. And looking at all of this as processes, I think, is going to be important rather than entities. I think you're absolutely right. Uh, I think that uh, I'm playing with a number of things here, and one of them is looking at the body as an ongoing process, which of course is what metabolism is about. Metabolism is the most boring thing that we teach our students, and it's the most important. Metabolism and meiosis, I mean, anyway. <laughs> but metabolism is nothing else than the ability to retain your individuality by changing your parts. The only way you could retain your individuality is to change your parts. That's metabolism. And I'm seeing this symbiosis as kind of like metabolism because we take something in and it goes out. Uh, we eat, we excrete. It's not only metabolic, but it's symbiotic. symbiotic that we're, getting, we're taking in and we're getting rid of. Uh, so, yeah, I'm seeing us as passing through the world as the world passes through us. Uh, so that makes us, in a Whiteheadian sense, a concretion. We're several processes organized together to create what we view as, as an individual, but this individual is changing all the time. It like never rivers. is the same. What? Like rivers. Like rivers. Rivers and flames. And again, uh, uh, Huxley used that metaphor of the whirlpool. And, you know, there's a whirlpool. There's a whirlpool. And that whirlpool is different. You know, Periclitus, you can't step, step in the same stream twice. Yeah, I, it, the, and so this notion of change while constant is something that I think is part of this new biology. It's part of a biology of relations. And I think it goes back to people like Huxley, who saw biology in this way, and uh, also uh, people like C.H. Waddington, uh, Conrad Hal Waddington, who saw development as homeoresis, not homeostasis, but how do you keep the constancy while changing your development? So I think, yeah, I think we need to find metaphors. Another metaphor, actually, a metaphor which is used all the time, but not consciously, is we talk about communities. Well, what about real communities? What about communities in the social sense? You could say, you know, Helsinki. Well, that has changed constantly, yet it's kept its own selfhood, yet it's changed. Where's the boundaries of Helsinki? Well, that's a very flexible thing, and it depends on what you're measuring. You know, and so I think that uh, the notion that when we say a biological community, that's using a very powerful metaphor and uh, 
I sh and the community metaphor might actually be a good one. Uh, I come from psychology, so my background is completely different, and I might, might be a bit ignorant of the biological concepts that you use. Uh, but um, in psychology, uh, there's this um, currently people are trying to find genes for different kinds of behaviors, such as personality, genes behind personality, and that seems to be getting nowhere at the moment. Mm -hmm. So, um, what is your, I mean, do you, from this perspective, do you think that it's incredibly naive to try, even try that, even mm -hmm. go to that direction, or should we, should we <laughs> go to change our perspective all to that? Yeah. Uh, I'm very much against the notion of genes for personality. Uh, I think that genes allow us to have a repertoire but it's not saying it's going to be this and that. It's going to say we, the genome will allow this repertoire of personalities to exist. And if you don't have this gene, you can't have those personalities. That's an easy thing. If you have you know, a gene for uh, 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 HGPRT deficiency, you will have a certain personality because you can't have others. But I think that uh, one of, well, Stephen Jay Gould gave a lecture at the Mutter Museum several years ago where he put himself in front of the death cast of Ang and Chang Bunker. Now, Ang and Chang Bunker were the original Siamese twins. They were exhibited by P.T. Barnum. Actually, they exhibited themselves through P.T. Barnum. And they had the same genome. They were identical twins. They had the same environment. They were conjoined twins. Ang, or one of the twins, was morose, and liked his whiskey straight. The other twin was jolly and was a teetotaler, would not have a drink at all. They were very different personalities, yet they had exactly the same genes and the same environment. Uh, they had an, a rule that one week they lived in Chang's house and Chang would rule, and the other week they lived in Ang's house and Ang would rule. So they worked this out between them. But they were very different, and I think that uh, those people who are parents of twins know very well that identical twins can have very different personalities. And so I don't, I think that the mix, that personality is going to be a really interesting mixture, not only of genes and environment, but also experience. How do you experience the environment? And that, of course, brings with it all the preconditions. You know, some people will like this and have great memories of this particular wine and other people leave some cold. And yes, there's some genetics which say this wine might be good, but there's also a lot of, pers a lot of memories that go into it. So I think that a gene for personality uh, is not a good, good path to travel. They discovered the shy gene. It was hiding behind two other genes. <laughs> First of all, thanks very much for a very interesting and provocative presentation from Stephen Van, a college student here in the UK. And I'm wondering about the implications of this uh, evolutionary processes and natural selection. You can see how it will work at the individual level that is now this team. Mm -hmm. And the, the, the fitness of that individual will depend on the symbionts. But what about the symbionts within this team? Is traditional National selection, natural selection, and evolutionary process is appropriate for how the symbionts, right, yeah, um, for their fitness and how, how the team develops. Right, and this is this is getting into a new area where now the symbionts environment is the body with all its symbionts. So you have this the genotype of the body which could produce more mucus or less mucus, for instance. There's all sorts of things that the genome can do of the body. Then there are which bacteria one has as components of that body and how this bacteria can be part of this community. And so you have a lot of selection 
for the symbiont by the conditions it's living in. There's been some remarkable studies that have been done on some animals, some insects, that get resistance to insecticides through, their bac through the bacteria. Now, the bacteria is making this compound, which was used for something else, but it now allows it to get into a host and make that host resistant to uh, insecticides so it can now flourish as it had never flourished before. And so I think that there's a whole new area of microbiology which is involved in looking at symbiosis in terms of natural selection, but natural selection within a complex changing environment. Uh, and when we change that environment, which we do every time we eat, we select for pre-existing bacteria. If we eat a plant, a plant diet, we get different bacteria than if we eat an animal diet. If we have wine, there's one particular bacteria that loves the, uh, grape, uh, the grape sugars uh, that are in wine. And uh, actually, it's Bacteroides theta, one of the ones I mentioned there. Uh, that will rise to a large degree every time we have wine. And so, yeah, we're constantly playing with our microbial environment. Thank you. We have to finish there. I have a break of 30 minutes and we'll see you next time. Thank you. Thank you.